My name is Ashley DeFranza and this is Nicole Lamb and we did our project on the effects of subliminal messaging on the subconscious mind and we tested it through a process that Nicole's going to explain. Yes. So what we did is that we took a video from YouTube, of course. It's called The Japanese Game Show. It's really interesting so that people would watch it for the full five minutes. And we made three different forms of it. Group one had flashes of the color red. Group two was our control group, and they had no flashes so that we could compare the other two groups to it. And group three had flashes of the word red. And then we had each group watch their own video. And afterwards, we had them take a survey and pick either a blue pen, a red pen, or a black pen. And depending on what pen they chose is whether or not the subliminal messages worked. So if they picked a red pen, it worked. And here's Ashley to tell you our results. Based on our results, we figured that subliminal messages didn't really work. We found that the red pen wasn't picked most in groups one or two, which is understandable. But in group three, it was the majority. And we decided that that might be because of the fact that it was a text subliminal message, it was the word red instead of a color red, which can also be supported from an um, experiment done in 1957 at a movie theater in Texas where they flashed drink Coca-Cola during their movies and the Coca-Cola sales went up by 18.1%. Sorry, that was fast. <laughs> Thank you. How did you expose the fruit flies to the emissions of the cell phone? What we did was we, um, we put the uh, fruit flies in a, uh, an aluminum bowl and since the cell phone waves can't transmit through aluminum um, they when we put the phone in the aluminum bowl it couldn't go through the sides or the bottom and so we knew that the waves had to be going up and since the fruit flies were up from the phone they had to be going through the fruit flies so we basically just by process of elimination of eliminating all the other ways for the um, waves to go. They had to be going through the fruit flies. All right, then my other question: You just had the phone on, or were you actually making calls? Like we made, a, we made a call, so it would it was one. We place a call, and then let like put it on mute, but it would be a call. It would be transmitting for one minute, and then we'd end the call. And then who paid for all this call on your cell phone? Um, we did it after nine o'clock, so it was unlimited nights. Now that's good thinking. Well, actually, not really. We racked up a huge bill, but. <laughs> I don't even know how. So Ryan, after all this, how did you compare the four samples now? Well, we use climbing assays, which basically we take the speed of each fly climbing a certain distance and compare that and the different flies over different times who are exposed to different amounts of radiation, they were affected differently. So the flies who were exposed to more cell phone radiation ended up being slower and taking longer to climb at the end of the radiation than the flies who received less radiation. Therefore, you can prove that more cell phone radiation leads to more brain damage in flies. I'm Amy Sung, and I'm here with Gretchen Cilio, and our project is the production of poly-beta-hydroxybutyric acid in carbon sources. Um, poly-beta-hydroxybutyric acid is a type of polymer that can be used to produce biodegradable plastics. These biodegradable plastics have similar properties to regular plastics made of petroleum based except they're <laughs> so except they're biodegradable based on our data we discovered that in maple syrup the most poly beta hydroxybutyric acid was produced as well as in glucose and glycerol however um, it was good that the most was in maple syrup because it's a natural product and it's abundant. <laughs> um, well, in commercial uses, perhaps this plastic or this polymer can be used to create more biodegradable plastics as a substitution for the petroleum-based plastics, which harm the environment by building up in landfills. And if it biodegrades, there will be less waste on the earth. How much? Um petroleum-based, do you think, can be replaced? Um, I don't know. Well, there are different types of the PHB, and some types are more elastic and can be used for, like, plastic bags, and there are other types that are more durable and hard, which can be used for anything that's, like, light switch covers or anything like that. Uh, could it ever be used for fuel? For fuel? Fuel. Plastic? Oh, is that, oh my goodness, was that a dumb question? 
I don't think well the plastic sorry. I don't think it can be used as a fuel because although the plastics that we're trying to replace are petroleum based, but it's a different material. So petroleum it can be a fuel, but the petroleum based plastics can't be a fuel specifically. And the poly beta hydroxybutyric acid would be making a substitution for the plastic alone. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. My name is John Hinkle, and uh, this is my project. It's called the Head Controlled Mouse Interface. It's pretty much exactly what it says it is. It's a way for a quadriplegic, stroke victim, or any other disabled person to control the computer, just as if they were controlling a mouse. If you look here, I have a demonstration. All right. So if you move right, if you tilt your head right like this, it moves right. If you tilt your head left, it moves left. And same thing for down and up. Just move your head in the corresponding direction, and it responds. Now, as far as clicking goes, I have it built in on a timer system. So now all you have to do is stay still on what you want to click on, and it does it. Now say you wanted to close something, you just go right over here and close it. And it's the, it's the same thing for all these other modes. It's wor they work on a timer system. So everything you can do with a mouse, you can do with this, with this device. You can left click, right click, double click, scroll, select text, click and drag, the, everything. And that's basically my program. Uh, also, I can adjust, I can adjust the sensitivity based on based on uh, you know your, your comfort level and based on seat and desk height. So when can we buy these? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying. I'm thinking of uh, thinking of doing something with patenting, but we'll see if I can get the money. That's the. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Anthony Damari, and for my science fair project, I decided to utilize uh, water siphons to generate electricity. And essentially, what that means is that by simply starting the siphon, which is kind of like an automatic water pump, it can produce energy by uh, utilizing something simple as a small screw. And Basically, I carved it out of foam and inserted it inside the siphon. And when the siphon, uh, well, when the siphon is started, it turns the screw, which then, so it'll actually turn this axle right here, which will then be attached to a generator. And theoretically, uh, this will keep going by itself. Now, applications of this particular project can range anywhere uh, from simple household applications to something as uh, dire as third world countries where there is no electricity to be invested in these systems. So I got the price down for this entire system to $25.55. And with that price, that can provide a village with a possibility of recharging a cell phone that could save someone's life or even something like a UV lamp that could possibly uh, purify water and to be able to provide that for a, a needy uh, country such as Africa um, would be a huge feat and that was basically uh, basically where I was going with my project.